Thank you, Connie, and thanks to everybody for attending this evening, uh, both in the building here and then those of you who have joined us virtually. Um, we appreciate that as well. Uh, it's really exciting. I love uh, State of the City. Opportunity for me to get a chance to share with you the things that uh, went on in 2022 of great significance and then also some of our plans for 2023. So it's great to have uh, a good crowd here tonight. Um, we will do questions, Q&A at the end. So if you're thinking of a question, you know, jot it down. I'd, I'm happy to stay for as long as there's questions, either uh, virtually, you'll have a chance to type those in or, or right here in the building. I would like if you would indulge me to introduce a few folks who I'm really privileged to work really closely with that um, as we share a lot of accomplishments here. These folks deserve recognition along with our entire workforce at the city. Obviously, I can't name everybody, but these are the ones that I work exceptionally close with. First of all, our city council members, a number of them are here tonight. Um, and if they would just raise their hand as I call them out, our council president, Camille Norton, uh, council member, Steve Muller, uh, council member, Tom King, I think, Tom, yep, Tom's here. Uh, council member, Michael Stevens, council member, Kelly Richards back there, council member, Peter Condelius. Yeah, I think council member, Mark James is out of town tonight. Um, so I want to thank, you know, our city council, uh, is amazing. They do great work, um, and uh, I just love the working relationship that we have between the executive and legislative branches of the government here. I think that's critical. I want to welcome uh, Judge Fred Gillings back there. Thank you for coming, Judge. Uh, appreciate the work of our judge. We also have Lori Towers as our other judge, and uh, Susie Elsner is here also. She's our court administrator. Thank you for coming. I think we have at least one planning commissioner here, uh, Zebo Zhu, I saw. Yeah, somewhere. Oh, there he is. Yeah, new, new uh, member of our planning commission. Really excited about the energy he's bringing to that. Is there any other planning commissioners that I missed? Oh, th thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you for coming. So we've got um, Shannon as well as Zebo here. And there are, I think, our two newest planning commissioners. So it's fantastic to have you both here. Um, Shannon Jordan. Um, and so also the director team that I get a privilege of working with really closely on a day-to-day -day basis. Our CAO, Gloria Hiroshima, who's uh, joining us virtually tonight. Police Chief Eric Skerpin, Assistant Chief Jim Lawless back here, uh, and uh, Public Works Director Jeff Laycock in the back. Parks, Culture, and Recreation Director Tara Mizell over here. Community Development Director Haley Miller, who I saw earlier as well. Um, Finance Director Crystal Woolridge is also here. Thank you, Crystal. Human Resources Director Megan Hodgson is joining us virtually. And our City Attorney John Walker. Yeah, John, thanks. It's great to see uh, John here as well. Stefan Doherty, Doherty uh, over there. He runs the whole IS. So Stefan's been busy moving us into this new building, him and his team. And finally, those who contributed so much to putting tonight's presentation together are Connie Many, who you saw up here earlier, and Bridget Larson, our communication specialist here. Riley also here uh, uh, assisting as well. I appreciate that. So a quick overview um, as we go to the first slide. I always like to start with uh, where we are uh, at with residents, so 72,000, just over 72,000 residents, second largest city in the county. We've really distanced ourselves from Lake Stevens, Linwood, and Edmonds, uh, and then you know we're still a ways behind Everett, so we're kind of slotted in that secondary. We'll probably stay there, um, just for those who are curious. Um, and then on to the city operating budgets. Another one, a slide I like to start with. So. As you look at that pie chart, you'll notice enterprise funds, those are the, um, so when you see uh, a, city a city council pass the budget, you'll notice a number. As you see, almost half of that is slotted in for enterprise funds, water, sewer, garbage. Those are fee-based systems. You can't take any of that 52 million there and spend it on roads or police or, or fire or anything like that. Um, and then the rest is your general fund that you see there, the 65 million. And I think it's also one of the things I always like to mention. I, sometimes citizens will say, or hear comments of, uh, you know, don't raise our property taxes anymore or things of that nature. Well, the, city, the city's portion of the property tax is about 10% of your overall property tax bill. That's always surprising to people. They, I think, you know, probably rightfully presume that that's a good chunk of their property tax bill. Um, one other thing that I will say is that, uh, uh, I haven't presented and the council hasn't passed a um, tax rate increase on your property taxes for over 10 years now with no property tax increase. So what we tend to do, I think, as a city is if we feel that we need something or we feel that the community wants something, we'll go to you and ask you to vote, vote on it. Transportation Benefit Di District was an example of that 10 years ago that paves roads. Um, this building uh, was an example of that. And so... That's kind of how we handle it, but uh, I really appreciate that fiscal responsibility. 
on the part of the city and the city council. Uh, our AA bond rating helps us uh, keep your, your debt, uh, the debt that we incur um, at a low interest rate. Uh, we've had two increases in the last few years on that, and so that's something I always like to mention as well. Um, broad expense categories on the next slide, you can kind of get a look there. Uh, public Works 59%, which you saw in the last one. Of your general fund, uh, public safety certainly takes up the vast majority of, of the general fund, as you see there, which is the same in just about every community, whether it's cities or county. Public safety is uh, really a top priority of citizens and also uh, of your government. Community development block grants is something, along with a number of other grants, that I like to highlight. So this is an area where uh, we're able to, to highlight support for the community from non-traditional uh, sources. So community development block grants are federal money that for cities our size come straight to us and then we're able to have a committee that uh, doles that out into the community to different uh, causes. <clears throat> so we spent about $626,000 on that. In different public services, it can go for everything from uh, crosswalks, we did three of those, flashing beacons on 7th and Columbia, 8th and Columbia, 7th and Alder, senior minor home repairs, uh, boys and girls club facility upgrade. So community development block grants are designed to take uh, areas of the community that may need some assistance financially and build those up. Um, but in addition to that, we have uh, council approved community services grants. Um, and those went to the Marysville Community Food Bank, Food for Thought Program, Senior Meals on Wheels, the Homeless Support Services, and the Cold Weather Shelter, which is critical this time of year, Rental and Housing Assistance, and Senior and Disabled Chore Services. And I want to thank all these partner organizations that you're seeing up on the screen there for all the great work they do in this community. Um, that is the bulk of the work in these areas. The city obviously supplements it with some of these funds, but when you look at these logos up here, um, these are, these are folks that really invest heavily in our community and helping those that are in need and in difficult situations, and it's a huge asset to our community to have this level of, uh, of volunteerism. So on to public safety. This is uh, where we can dive deep into some things I know that are of interest to the community. We'll start with calls for service right there. Um, calls for service actually dropped about 3.8% in 2022 over uh, as compared to 2021. And you can see it's kind of fluctuated if you look at the screen there um, over the years. <clears throat> but crime levels is, is the one that we really pay, pay close attention to. Chief and I regularly meet on that. And I've been saying this for a number of years and the graph bears it out. We peaked in 2014 and I remember when we peaked and we were having a real rash of burglaries. Um, I don't know if you all remember, but home burglaries, burglaries were skyrocketing. There was a newspaper story about this group that would watch for funeral announcements. They knew people were not home. They would go um, break into houses, and that's just one, one of, a, of a number. But we formed um, a uh, um, burglary task force. So our, our police department formed a burglary task force. It was a great strategy, implemented tremendously on the ground. And we also uh, really had our night team get deep into the drug issue. Um, our, uh, and consistently from 2014 to 2020, we're driving crime down steadily over those years, as you can see. And then it started ticking up in 2021 and 2022. And so I think it's a really important story to tell that when our officers are uh, given the resources and the tools and have the ability through the legal system to combat crime, they do a really, really good job of it. As you can see there, uh, unfortunately, in 2021, we bumped up against um, some, I believe, unfortunate uh, decisions in the state legislature, which really tied the hands of a lot uh, of what we were doing here in Marysville and all throughout Snohomish County um, by way of, I'll just mention a couple of them. There's others, but one would be the Blake decision, if you've heard of that. The Blake decision essentially um, was a Supreme Court, state Supreme Court decision that legalized uh, most drugs throughout the state. And the state legislature, so our council immediately after the Blake decision recriminalized uh, drug possession. But then the state legislature, and when they passed something, it supersedes whatever cities do, came in and said, no, um, we're not going to do it that way. They implemented a law on drug possession where your police officers, if they catch somebody out, you know, in a park or in a car or anywhere with drug paraphernalia and things like that, they uh, have to give them one uh, they, they refer them to treatment one time. If they say, no, I don't want to go to treatment, they can't do anything else. They catch, if they happen to catch them a second time in this community in Marysville, they have to do the same thing again, say, do you want to go to treatment? If they say no, then they have to just release them, wa watch them walk away. Only on the third time 
and if it's documented and if it's in the city again, can they uh, can they go ahead and arrest them and deal with that? So I want to touch a little bit on that uh, in a moment. I'll talk a little bit more about that. The, the other uh, bill was a pursuits bill, which essentially um, will not will not allow police pursuits throughout this state, except for the extremely extremely rare circumstances. Um, we don't pursue. We were not pursuing much in Marysville anyway. Most police departments don't. Uh, but the problem is, is when you announce to the criminal world that you can't be pursued, guess what happens? What we're seeing today, it's a race from the from the supermarket uh, parking lot with all the stuff you've stolen to your car to try and beat the officer. And once you do, you're off, and nobody can do anything about it. Or what the state patrol is finding is that people just stop pulling over <laughs> when when they're speeding and they're told to pull over, they just keep on going because nobody can pull them over. Um, so anyway, that's a problem as well. So uh, I'll, I'll get to, to some of this here in a minute, but um, I wanted to give you that uh, as, a, as a backdrop. One thing that we're doing, there's a group of, uh, I co-lead a group called Mayors and Business Leaders for Public Safety in Snohomish County. We have 15 mayors in Snohomish County across the ideological spectrum, from Democrat to Republican and everything in between. 15 mayors, that's almost every mayor in the county, that has come together with a number of business leaders and said, hey, we need change in this area. And I know our council is wholeheartedly uh, behind this as well and works hard on this uh, also. We were all in Olympia last week working on this. And the idea is, uh, and it's not just the state legislature, although we're, we're needing changes there, there's a lot of changes that need to be made around the culture of public safety in our state. And so we're working with uh, four Democrat and four Republican legislators from Snohomish County. I'm really pleased to see that bipartisan group team to get, uh, come together. We already have uh, Senator June Robinson's drafted a bill to fix the Blake decision um, that she's uh, put forward, which is a great bipartisan uh, bill. And so um, there's some pursuit legislation uh, being put forward. Senator Lovick's put forward um, a regional recruiting, a regional training centers initiative that would allow us to train more of our police officers. So these are important things. We'll keep working on them very closely to see those changes. And again, it doesn't end with just a few legislative fixes. We need, um, you know, work work in a, in a number of other areas. One thing I wanted to point out here, um, as I talked about the drug issue, is we've always in this community um, for the last several years had an embedded social worker team, I think it's about four or five years now. So we were leading, like almost every community, leading with compassion anyway. Nobody in government or in police forces today really thinks that the solution is to grab people doing drugs and just throw them in jail. That's not a great solution. It's an expensive solution. Um, it doesn't get at the root of the problem. But what it does do is when you have uh, the accountability measure that says, you know what, we can and we will prosecute you for this if you don't get help, if you don't go into treatment. We're going to prosecute the items you've stolen. We're going to prosecute the illegal trespassing. We're going to prosecute the illegal uh, drug paraphernalia, the drug dealing, or whatever it is. That rap sheet is going to be prosecuted unless you get help. And that's what this embedded social worker team does. They would go out and work with these folks and say, let's do it the right way. Let's get you the help you need so that you can reform your life. And, uh, but I'll tell you, not everybody takes the help. And I think most law-abiding citizens would rather, if they won't take the help, get them off the street into a correctional facility where they're not um, doing illegal things and, and harming uh, you know, innocent uh, people in our community. And I'll tell you that a good chunk of our referrals into treatment come out of our jail. So they're going to detox one way or another. So um, if they go into jail and detox, a lot of times they be get in the right frame of mind where they say, yeah, rather than sit here and go back out and do this all over again, now that I'm detoxed a little bit, why don't I just go into a treatment facility and get this taken care of? We've noticed more and more of our, and I could tell you some really touching stories um, of people coming out of jail that said, thank God the city of Marysville had tough love with me because now I'm reformed, I'm, I've got a job, reunited with my family. And so it's important work. There's some highlights of what they did just this past year. Over the course of the whole program, we're getting close to, I think, 200 people we've graduated through treatment. So I don't want to give the impression that as we look for these laws, I think, I think the intent behind what the legislature did with that three referrals, I think the intent was, was a good intent. But I just think it was um, something that, you know, that, that was misguided from the standpoint that it has to have an accountability measure in order to work. People won't just go to treatment voluntarily in most cases. Um, code enforcement, as we move on, uh, total case openings 
and, and cases closed, you'll see there. The code enforcement team is just phenomenal. Um, this is designed to make sure that we have a community image that we're proud of and that neighborhoods are kept up. And so you can see how many cases they've opened. The 429 closed, I think, is really remarkable. Um, they also had 11 infractions and five criminal referrals, um, 63 abandoned vehicle complaints that they dealt with, 18 vehicle impounds, uh, junk vehicle affidavits. They had 90 of those. These help owners remove illegal vehicles and get them into a scrapyard. Um, and for the first time, the code enforcement team issued the five cr criminal referrals that I talked to this year. So almost all of our code enforcement uh, compliance is voluntary. Code enforcement is not designed to be a heavy, heavy thing. If, you know, if somebody's got a lot of junk sitting in their front yard, old couches or beat up cars that aren't licensed that are sitting on blocks in their front yard where it's really visible in the neighborhood, usually it's a simple thing of going up and, and talking to the homeowner and saying, hey, over the next month or so, can you, can you just take care of that? We'll come back and check it. Most of them get solved that way, but you do have some uh, that really dig in and become, you know, whether it's a hoarding situation or whatnot, really become, and a lot of times it's, you know, these are really tough cases. Um, you've probably heard of some of them that we've dealt with in our community, and so they will need to go down a, a little bit tougher path in order to keep the health of the local neighborhood and the property values of their neighbors up. Custody. Um, so we do have a new modern jail here on the north end of this facility. We moved from a 5,000 square foot jail to a 20,000 square foot facility and added all the staff needed to operate it. I want to tell you that the key really to the modern jail, um, one of the keys, I shouldn't say the key, but in, in the old jail that we had, it was a dormitory style facility. So you had, I think, three for men and two for women. Well, in today's world, um, you're getting a type of situation that's much different from what we had before where everybody just goes in and has their bed. If somebody comes in to detox, particularly on fentanyl right now, which is an uh, from what I hear, just a gruesome detox. Um, you can't stick them in with 15 other people. They have to have their own cell. So the modern facilities, like the one we have here, um, provide cell, cells with two persons uh, each, two people each. And so what we're not doing now is clearing out an entire dorm and reducing the jail capacity by 16 people when we bring somebody into detox. Now we just have to clear out one room of two, and we still have 98 other, the potential for 98 other. So I think that's important to remember that um, it isn't just about the number of people you house, it's how you house them and how does it meet the current needs of society. And um, we have enhanced nursing and medical facilities in our jail now to help people through this process. Um, like I said, our embedded social worker team is right there so that when they want to get into treatment, and go beyond just what's happening in the jail with, with the treatment they have there, we can do that immediately. Um, so, uh, and I say that because most of our property crimes stem from the drug issue. That's just the reality, unfortunately. A lot of people are just stealing to get drugs, and that's just, uh, if you eliminated the drug problem in society, you would eliminate almost all the property crime. Um, hiring and recruiting, this is an area when I talked about the culture of public safety in the state, you know, we've really seen a lot of people leave uh, policing, and there's not a lot of people that are coming back right now, particularly in this state. You know, we used to get laterals from Montana, Idaho, a lot of other states. That's not happening anymore. So we really want to create a culture that uh, encourages people to get into this line of work. Or we have a situation like almost every city is facing now that all those other mayors that I talked to you about are facing the same thing, where we have uh, nine current officer vacancies. But another problem is it's just not the nine current vacancies. We have a load of people hired that we can't get into the academy because there's such a long waiting list. Uh, Assistant Chief Lawless told me today that we hired somebody, and I think it's December before we get them into the academy. So think about that. And if we let them go, somebody else will hire them. So we've got we've to hold them for 11, 10 or 11 months before they get into academy. So we have them work as community service officers and do some different things. But what we need is things like uh, the proposal for regional academies. We need more police academies right now to get these folks trained and onto the streets for every city, not just Marysville. Um, so we're not waiting a year to get them into academy almost, and then another several months to get them on the street. I want to thank uh, uh, our team also for this. this uh, in December, we presented to the city council and the council unanimously approved. I want to thank the city council for this. Unanimously approved two new very important ordinances. <clears throat> the most important one was a drug a public drug use ordinance that criminalized public drug use. So what we did 
is we sat down, uh, city attorney and I and the police chief in uh, December, and the drug possession one that the state had that I described to you, that covers drug possession. If you find somebody possessing drugs, which they were certainly going to use or had used, you, you can't do anything. You can do the referrals like I talked about. But the state is silent on public drug use because it used to always be prosecuted under the possession law, which went away with the Blake decision. So we figured out, well, we could, we could put in a public drug use law and uh, deal, with, deal with that at least. Now, this doesn't remove the need to cover possession. We would be far more successful with possession because it's not always easy to witness somebody using drugs. But I know I'm surprised, and I think you will be, that we've already got 39 arrests since December 12th under the public drug use. So that shows you just how many times you can witness public drug use. What really drove this for me is getting a call, getting a few calls like this. But one was a call from a restaurant owner that said, hey, I'm sending young girls, young women, out into the back of the restaurant to empty trash. And almost every time they're bumping into people doing fentanyl back there. And it's terrifying, and it's gross, and... We can't have this, and we can't. You know, you can't have that in a community. And so now they're able to call police. The police can come out and deal with it. And again, with the use, we're always looking for treatment. That's the number one option. Try to convince them to go into treatment. But if they refuse, we at least have some teeth behind it. So kudos to the city council for passing this. The other one was disruptive transit behavior, which we work with our friends at Community Transit. We have some of them here tonight. Uh, Community Transit's done a great job of dealing with this. I'm on that board uh, on a macro level. The reason we put this into city code is because we can prosecute it locally. We control our own destiny. We don't have to depend on the county prosecutor who may not have the resources to take the case. We can have our two city prosecutors or our city prosecution team deal with it locally. Move on to emergency management here. Um, so emergency management is something we brought in house several years ago, and our team does a phenomenal job. Training, uh, we have trainings at our emergency operations center on a regular basis. We added a grant-funded radio communication program, which is really important, and more than uh, 50 public activities where we train uh, community emergency response teams, CERT training. If any, I don't know, has anybody been through the CERT training in here? Yeah, well, Kelly, great. Um, preparedness classes and presentations. You can also sign up if you'd like for Marysville alerts and get emergency text alert, alerts from the city through our website. We added a Spanish option for that, a Spanish language option for that in 2022. So everybody always likes to see in uh, State of the City kind of what businesses came in 22 and what are coming in the, in the next year. This is an exhaustive, um, not everybody uh, lets us know, and, and we, don't, we don't necessarily gather all the businesses, but this gives you an idea of some of the business that came in. While you're looking at that, I'll highlight maybe a couple. Um, Soli Organics is an interesting business that came out into our Cascade Industrial Center. They uh, grow 100% USDA certified organic produce for distribution to over 20,000 retail outlets throughout the country. That's happening right out uh, in Marysville there. Um, Largo Tents is another really neat uh, industry that came into town. Um, it's amazing what this, this is the heavy duty tents for um, free events and things like that. There was all kinds of people at the grand opening that I went to from out of this city, you know, from Linwood or elsewhere. There's not a lot of people that do this. And so it was exciting to see that and what a reputation that that, uh, that, that business has. So what's coming in 23? Here's some of them. Again, we don't know, not everybody's uh, announced, but I'll highlight a couple here too. Um, one that I got a chance to meet with real recently was Gravitics. Gravitics is a space module company, believe it or not, that's operated right here in Marysville. So they uh, have raised $20 million to uh, go ahead and build space modules. And so if you're planning on living or working in space over the next couple of decades, <laughs> you may very well be using a Gravitics space module to do that. Um, so hoping to take a tour of that business when they really get ramped up here in, I think, March of 23. Um, but that's one to keep an eye on. Uh, and then additionally, um, SmartCap and, and North Point are building uh, an amazing amount of industrial buildings that you'll see a lot of businesses move into. We also have Salacia Food Processing, um, which is a fish processing plant. So the goal in our Cascade Industrial Center, which is out north from 132nd, on the east side of state all the way through the Arlington Airport area and a little bit beyond, so it's Arlington and Marysville, is to create family wage jobs in our communities for those that don't necessarily want to commute. Um, so we're hoping to create those kind of jobs here. 
And at the end of last year, we had permits issued for over 650,000 square feet of industrial space out there already, <clears throat> um, another 300,000 of buildings proposed, proposed for this year. Investing in Marysville. So there's just gives you a snapshot of the building permits and some of the construction value in the community. Um, big projects in permitting that might interest you that are under construction is the Everett Clinic on Sober Hill. Uh, Salacia Food Processing, which I met, uh, just mentioned. James G. Murphy Auction is actually uh, coming to Marysville. And the Kendall Subaru dealership is moving uh, to Marysville. So that'll add to our auto row. One important thing when I mentioned property taxes earlier, um, the council hasn't uh, raised the city's percentage of property taxes in over 10 years. We made a conscious decision to try and bring commercial uh, entities here because, A, people could do their shopping locally and not have to drive all over. That's, when I first doorbelled the community, when I first ran for office, that was the thing I heard most. This was quite a few years ago. But please, you know, get auto dealerships, restaurants, you know, Costco's and Best Buy's, all that, so we don't have to go to Linwood or Everett and we can keep the money at home. And that's really worked. Um, that sales tax money helps us keep property taxes low and helps people from outside the community pay for your roads and your police and everything else when they come in and shop in Marysville. Civic Center, the building you're in now, um, we're really excited to move in here uh, this, this last fall. And, uh, you know, this was something that we looked at back in the mid to late 2000s, the Great Recession hit. And, uh, of course, it didn't work out then, but this, this time around it did. And um, it was a voter-approved uh, one-tenth of one percent sales tax that funded the public safety portion and then some of our savings in the other buildings we sold off funded this uh, part here. Brings multiple city departments under one roof like the video mentioned and just really allows us to have a more uh, energy efficient and, uh, and I think uh, long-term economically viable facility that will take this city decades into the future. It was critical for public safety, too. The police uh, were on that Grove Street building that was built back in the 80s when we were a community of about 11,000. And um, I mentioned some of the reasons the jail were inadequate, not just because it was too small, but because of the way it was structured. Um, we, we, we were emptying out you know, the ability to put many people in there because of that situation. Um, but also just the uh, fact that we, we had a growing police force and nowhere to put them. So it was really primarily critical for our police department and our, our um, courts to get in here. But it's just been a great facility all around. So hopefully you've got a chance to look through it uh, tonight if you hadn't before. Comfort Park renovations. I'm really excited about this piece of it, too, as kind of a community gathering center. Who was here for Marysville for the holidays? Yep, a few of you. That gives you a glimpse of kind of what you can do out here, but it'll be in the spring and summer. I think you'll really see it as we begin to, um, you know, add some uh, new grass and a sprinkler system and some new um, shrubbery and things like that. The new restroom, I think, is something that people will be excited about, particularly when the spray park opens. So we're excited about that. I really appreciate that the council preserved the over 100-year-old water tower um, and gave it a, a, a nice makeover, and it really is something – you know, we got so many comments on that. People, I think when they see new buildings and things going up, they want to make sure that you're preserving the heritage. And um, we have some things out here that uh, some um, portraits and, uh, and a bench here that also helps preserve that heritage. We've got an old, uh, in this council meeting room here, we've got an old uh, table and the chairs. I think it was in the 1950s um, that the city council used to meet around that. And so we keep it here for that. You can go in there and take a look after if you want. So we're recreating a picture of that with our, our current council uh, as well. So it's, those are some of the fun things we try to preserve the culture while we uh, move on in, in a new building. Um, some of the downtown improvements as we move into downtown revitalization. You'll see here the stormwater treatment facility that's pictured um, down in the lower right-hand corner. That is important. We got $7.6 million in a, a Department of Ecology grant from the state to build that. So it'll treat stormwater runoff going into the EV slough, but it also, we tried to design it in a way, and a great job by our public works team, that would be aesthetically pleasing and kind of fit with the waterfront park area that we, we would like to see happen in the future. Also, we're working really closely um, with our economic development team on a river walk project in that downtown waterfront area. So looking ahead, the city envision, envisions kind of a mixed use um, development down there on the east end of state, south of First Street. So it'll capitalize on the waterfront access, uh, provide a welp welcoming and an inspirational gateway into the community, particularly when, which I'll talk about in a minute, the new I-5 
529 interchange comes in and drops a lot of people down there. So we hope to have some mixed use, some shops, housing, and some other opportunities. So look for some things there. We're working on some things that we can't necessarily announce right now, but um, we hope to in 2023. So this is the right there, the I-5 529 interchange. I've been telling you about this for years, and finally we're going to get some shovels in the ground here this year, get some dirt moving. Um, this project is a, was in the Connecting Washington State package from 2015, $42 million then, and they had to enhance it with some dollars later on. Uh, and so this essentially will put a roundabout at I-5 and SR-529 interchange northbound on-ramp from I-5 to 529, southbound from 529 onto I-5, and then also an extra HOV lane between Marine Drive and Everett and that new off-ramp. So kind of four pieces to that project. Uh, the whole thing should be completed by 2025. Hopefully you'll see the northbound on-ramp completed before that. That's the simplest part of the project. The southbound, I don't know if you can tell, kind of wraps up and around. is a little more complicated. But during construction, thankfully, um, I, I, they'll shift the lanes, but they won't close them down. So, I mean, not saying they'll never close them down for a short period of time, but they're going to keep three lanes open and just shift them over during construction. A couple other construction projects here. Um, you probably noticed... Uh, if you're driving State Avenue, that 100 to 104th uh, has been widened from three to five lanes. That was another project. We got $6.2 million in a state grant. Our public works team just does amazing work getting those grants. Um, this put a new bridge in over Quilcita Creek, widening that roadway from three to five lanes. Really significant environmental benefits as well, treating roadway runoff and restoring wildlife habitat. And now we're looking forward to completing um, the next phase, which is 104th to 116th, which will make all of state five lanes. So we got another $4 million state grant for that. That project will kick off later this year and be completed in the fall of 2024. So not just on and off ramps from the freeway, but we're trying to take care of the local roads as well. Pavement preservation, as we talk about building new roads, it's also really critical to keep the ones that you have in good uh, repair. And so I mentioned that transportation benefit district that the voters passed uh, almost a decade ago. All that money, you know, gets used in, in things like this. Um, we also did get $2.9 in federal funds for the two big projects there, State Ave from First to Grove, 116th from State to I-5. You'll see those paved here this summer. And then the other 11 projects on there. So excited about that. Grove Street overcrossing I want to touch on. This project is not fully funded. Council and I um, have been working on this in our with our um, federal delegation in Washington, D.C., as well as our state delegation. We were down in Olympia last week lobbying for this and other projects, but uh, we do have uh, $3 million in federal funding. Congressman Larson sponsored that uh, and got congressionally directed spending for that last year. We thank him for that. And 500000 from the city and five, over $5 million from the state. So we need about another $16 million, but we have enough now to do the design work, acquire the right-of-way, and kind of get going on that project. And then we need a, we're also lobbying for a 156th overcrossing. What that is, is uh, 156th where you see the overcrossing over the freeway, that was always designed to be a full interchange. And we have that funded through the state also. Uh, that was funded in, funded in the 2015 Connecting Washington package. So it, towards the end of this decade, you'll start to see work on that. It'll be a ways off. But once we do that, it'll feed into the east side heavily into that Cascade Industrial Center to help alleviate the traffic on 172nd and 116th. But when you go west, you'll notice that that rail crossing has been closed by BNSF for I think a couple decades now, which we really need a flyover there so that people can get off 156th, shoot over that and get, get out into the county or Tulalip or Marysville areas there. So we're lobbying for that. That's about a, almost an $18 million project. We did get 500000 from the state and uh, match that with the city to get design going on that also. Finally, in transportation, quiet zones. Just wanted to touch on that. People ask me about that a lot. We are. The council has funded a study of quiet zones, so we're looking into that. Quiet zones are really not as easy as they may seem. Um, you have to get the study done to determine what you have to do to each crossing by way of hardening it with all kinds of safety measures. Then you have to have BNSF weigh in and tell you what they need you to do. Then you have to go out to bid and construct all that, which is, you know, several million dollars of improvements, and then you can apply for the quiet zone. So this won't be a quick process, but we are uh, heading down the road to see how viable it would be for our community and if the dollars uh, make sense. You can, uh, a couple of things I wanted to let folks know about is you can report a pothole, report graffiti, or report 
Council Member Richard's favorite, report abandoned shopping carts <laughs> on our website. We really looked at the community to help us keep track of this because if we get a report for a pothole or for graffiti or abandoned shopping carts, we want to get out and clean those things up as quickly as possible so that the community image is maintained. Um, but we don't always see it. You know, uh, Sometimes I'll see them and come in and report them, but you all are eyes and ears out there. So use these uh, features, if you would, to help us with that. So we begin to wrap up here um, and think of questions, if you have any. I wanted to get with some of the quality of life things. We talk about live, work, play, so we've talked a lot about a lot of things, but uh, Parks, Culture, and Recreation, had a, we had a, a great year and a lot of new amenities we were able to add to the community. One was the pickleball courts at Jennings Park, and those are a lot of fun. I see some folks that have been out there. Um, I've enjoyed that a lot myself. Eight pickleball courts, fencing, stormwater, and infrastructure at Jennings Park, and uh, really has gotten rave reviews. We've got people already coming in from out of the community to use these and saying, boy, we got to get these in our community, and so we're excited about that. This project was funded by the council in July of 21. I want to thank them for doing that. Um, council stepped right up and funded this. And then our team had that completed by March of 2022. So what, eight, eight nine months, which is really a phenomenal. We would have had it done earlier, but the weather got in the way of the final coating. So we had to delay it. If you haven't been to the new community center that we opened in January, it's three times as large as the one we used to have here. It's right down at the old court building here. I'd encourage you to go. Um, I spent a little bit of time down there here this month and uh, all the classrooms and it's just, it's fun to walk in there. I think there's a picture. I was chatting with that uh, individual and his daughter uh, who was just getting out of her ballet class and he was just gushing about how they love the expanded classes and everything going on. There's a nice lounge area with uh, easy chairs for the parents waiting for their kids in a class where they can read or knit or just talk. And uh, so it's a, it's a great area for the community to gather uh, I also visited the Gord Woodcarvers class. Have you ever, has anybody ever seen Gord Woodcarving? It's amazing what they do. Um, so whether you're, you know, a senior or one of our young folks, uh, one of our young people like you see there, there's something for you to do at the community center. Strawberry Fields um, Athletic Complex, excited. We will be uh, adding a, uh, to one of those fields out there, turf, fencing, and bleachers to kind of make it uh, available year round. Um, that's one of the problems there is uh, the water prevents us from using this facility about half the year. So construction is expe expected in March for that to com be completed by June. We received $1 million from our partners at Snohomish County and $140,000 from Amazon to help pay for that. So we're excited about that. And then finally, a pump track. Um, we had a young man in the community step up and bring this idea uh, that uh, other communities have of a pump track. Pump track consists of a series of rollers and kind of bank turns. You see the drawing there, the sketch there. It's designed to be ridden by cyclists via pumping a bike rather than pedaling it. So they're extremely popular in the communities that have them. Um, there's an open house next week, as you see listed there, if you want to learn more about it or offer your thoughts. And then also at Jennings Park, the existing playground equipment and the restroom at the Nature Park will be replaced this year badly needed and uh, it is fast. I agree with you it's been a long time coming the council also has provided I, I just think this is fantastic not only that but the council has also budgeted to fix up neighborhood parks a few of them every single year so North Point East and Harborview will be this year what we don't want is a bunch of neighborhood parks that are rusted out that nobody uses anymore so we want them to be vibrant so the council really developed a plan um, to keep those up, so I think that's fantastic. Mother Nature's Window, we got a $750,000 grant uh, that Congressman Larson worked on as well for us this year that will advance the master plan for this. So we hope to open this in 2024. We'll put some parking in, some work on the trails, and, and get that uh, open as well. If you've never been to Mother Nature's Window, it's a great part of the community. And finally, our legislative priorities. I've talked a lot about them, but the council, there's a council we were down, that was, that was a really recent picture just from last week we were down there uh, working on those. So with that, uh, again, I appreciate you coming. Um, we, we have time for questions here, and we'll kind of alternate maybe between the live audience and then the online audience. And if you have any questions, uh, we'll start in the live audience here. Does anybody have a, a question that they've thought of? Love to answer questions. This would be like an expanded coffee clutch. Yes, back in the back there. How did you do that virtual thing? What, what virtual thing? Oh, are you talking about coffee clutches? 
We do some, some coffee clutches are virtual where we have them on Facebook Live, some are live, but I do hold regular coffee clutches um, around the community where it's just a, a Q&A. We had one at the community center last week. Um, so if you haven't attended one of those, uh, we'd love to have you. Yeah, so the coffee clash is what we do. Uh, the question was, how do you know when a coffee clash is going to happen? Um, we, we try to get them out in all the news sources, the paper, our, our social media feed. If, you, if you're on social media, that's the easiest way because we, we'll put it up several times before the coffee clash. I try and put it on my personal social media feed as well. Um, and then any other news outlet that will cover it and then, uh, you know, on our website. So, yep. And we try to have them at different times of the day. Sometimes they're 10 in the morning. Sometimes they're, you know, 5.30 in the evening or something like that, just to accommodate different schedules. Did we have any questions online? Yes. We have a question. Um, could there be a possibility of pedestrian bike overpass at the 88th Street Railroad Crossing? So the question, could there be a bike and pedestrian overpass at the 88th Street Rail Crossing? Um, you know, we've looked, that's an interesting question. Uh, it would be really, really expensive. We've looked at an actual overcrossing there for everything, but the problem is the cemetery and most cars and most people would want to get to State Avenue, so you would take them over State, and then how do you get them back around? And it just ends up being hundreds of millions of dollars from that standpoint to, to take a roadway like that over. Simply a bike and pedestrian one uh, would be cheaper. Um, I think, you know, you, you would probably still run into, Jeff, I don't know what your thoughts are, some of the problems we've had with right-of-way, because BNSF owns so much of the right-of-way, as well as the cemetery. Um, what do you think, uh, Jeff? I mean, we've never actually studied a, a bike one. We just looked at the, at the overall. I think one of the controlling issues there, too, is even to get over the railroad. You have to maintain a pretty high distance to do that. Uh, so I think that would be a really contributing, you know. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. In the building here, anybody else have a question here? Yes, sir. Oh, he'll bring a mic back then. Uh, uh, by the EV slew uh, landing there, the boat launch there, yeah. is it possible to get a, a no wake zone around there and a kayaker there? Several times I've almost been swamped by people oh. on their uh, sea dues or boats or something like that. I'm not looking for a big area, but maybe right around the river lane, I guess. That's a good thought. Uh, the question was, could we get a no-wake zone? Um, I'm just making sure people online can hear. Could we get a no-wake zone in the area down by the EB Slough for kayakers? That's a good thought. Um, we haven't had that brought to us. We could certainly look at that. I'm not sure what regulations and we need to go in, but uh, Tara, maybe we could, she's jotting her note down. Maybe we can take a look at that because um, we do want to, we really want to enhance the kayaking options down there. So if, if that makes it easier on you, that's something we should look at. Thanks for bringing that forward. Good idea. Online? Okay. We'll stay in the building here. Anybody else in the room? Questions on anything? Yes? Uh, there was plans at one time to complete the trail that is down at the EV Slough, the yeah. other side. Is that still on the table? Yeah, good question. Uh, the, he's, he asked about the plans to complete the EV Waterfront Trail. Yes, that is still on the table. <clears throat> in fact, that's one of our legislative asks was uh, about another million dollars in capital requests that would complete that. So far, the states um, responded to all the capital requests down there, and, and usually they like to help us finish a project that was started. So I believe we will get that funded and completed in the very near future. Great question. And yeah, a lot of people enjoy that EB Waterfront Trail, so we, wanted, we do want to complete that. Yes. Wait till he'll bring the mic over to you. Thanks. Yeah, the... The boat launch does have a, uh, a $10 fee now, like I think pretty much every other boat launch. The question was, is the boat launch uh, going to charge now? About every other community charges that. So we did have a $10 fee um, for that, and that's to help, honestly, maintain the boat launch area. We just thought we were, I think, the only city around here that did it for free, and a lot of people were coming from out of the city to use ours because it was free, and then your tax dollars were going to repair or, you know, to keep that up, and we just didn't see that is the most responsible thing to do for Marysville citizens. And so um, that's kind of what was driving that. Good question. Any other questions in here? Anything online? All right, one final call. Oh, good, we got another one. Since people are asking about traffic stuff, is it possible to get like um, a blinking four-way by 
83rd and Grove. Like when you're coming up Grove and you're taking a left on 83rd, it is like, you have to pull out almost into the road to even see. So it's just, and I've heard many car accidents over there. And so I was just wondering if that would be possible. That was from 83rd on to Grove? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Interesting. We'll have to study that. We do a, an analysis. Our engineering team does an analysis on any of those requests. There's state guidelines and different things that if it's warranted. So, uh, Director Laycock, would you mind putting that in the funnel for an analysis? Thank you. I also wanted to recognize, um, I listed off a few folks I knew were coming, but uh, Dr. Zach Robbins is in the audience tonight from our Marysville School District. Uh, yeah, get, go ahead and give him a hand. Uh, He's relatively new to our community. Um, I think uh, about, what, six months now maybe, been here full time. And I just uh, really appreciate the way that he's reached out proactively to city leadership to um, bring us in and, and uh, have regular meetings and, and uh, um, conversations around how we can partner together and what's going on in the school district, what's going on in the city. So Dr. Robbins has been a great partner. I really appreciate our relationship and I appreciate him coming tonight, thank you. And, uh, you know, you can't have strong communities without strong schools, and so uh, we appreciate that. Um, any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Uh, at one time I saw a drawing for a roundabout at 71st Silver Hill and Sunnyside. Is that still going to happen? Um, is that still on track? I'm going to have direct, see if Director Laycock can give us a timeline on that. Section ultimately is as part of growth, uh, capacity, and safety. Um, so, unfortunately, I don't have a timeline uh, at this point, but good question. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, we have a couple of uh, new, new questions. Online. Okay, One yeah, as a follow up to the question about the boat launch fees, um, why would we not um, increase the park's budget instead of? charging user fees? Yeah, so the, the question was, why would we not increase the parks budget instead of charging user fees for boat launch? Well, because uh, increasing the parks budget is your tax dollars. So, I mean, that means increasing the intake from you to subsidize um, a boat launch that a lot of people from out of town are using. I guess that's the short of it, long and the short of it. When you're the only, I think if there was a lot of people with free boat launches, we would have probably kept ours free. But the problem is when you're the only one that's free, then you attract a lot of people to your boat launch um, from out of the community. So we're not now just providing a service to our Marysville residents. We're subsidizing a service to people who come from out of town because they don't want to pay for the one in their city. And then you pay for all the repairs. So increasing the park budget to do that would just mean more tax dollars from you. So we figure a user fee for those that use the boat launch, you know, whether they're in Marysville or out of Marysville. Is probably, you know, just like if you go to, if you golf, you're paying for the golf keys, golf course upkeep. And we don't, when, when the inflation hits and we have to have um, more upkeep at the golf course, you know, then the greens fees go up. Um, it, we don't ask, you know, we, that's, that's how that, I think we just kind of looked at it similar with a boat launch. It went a long time when it was free, probably beyond what, uh, what it should have done. Um, but that's a good question and that's, I guess, the best answer. We think we had another one online. The other question, another question was about um, since the city changed the garbage collection to yeah. the folks in the central annexation area, yep. um, this person is concerned that uh, yard waste pickup is not frequent enough, and yeah. is there anything that can be done about that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I agree with that. So the question was, yard, yard waste not frequent enough. I think it's month, I'd probably referring to the monthly pickup during these winter months. The council and I are very concerned about that. It's in the contract with waste management to do it this way. We are trying to renegotiate that right now. Um, or 
find another way to get it uh, to be weekly year-round. So we agree with what the that is. We've heard that from others, and so uh, the trouble is, is we we don't. It's waste management that does that, and their contract specifies that they'll only do monthly during the winter months. So we would have to get that changed, which we're working on, and hopefully that will. Hopefully that'll be done maybe by by next year this time, so that you won't have to put up with that in the next off season. Yes, right here we have one. I'm always curious. Um, we see new houses being built and lots of apartments. Are they getting filled, or is it keeping up? Yeah. I can repeat it. Yeah, so you see a lot of new houses being built and apartments. Are they getting filled? Are we keeping up? They they definitely are getting filled. Um, you know what's interesting? We didn't see an apartment building in Marysville for about a decade, and then all of a sudden, I think the council and I and city staff even were a little alarmed as they just started going up everywhere. And that was because demand was so high, and they are getting filled, and the prices are going up. And so, um, you know, there's a real need for housing. I think, you know, you see that everywhere. The state legislature's debating that. Um, you know, it's interesting. I took a trip to another part of the country a few years ago, and I had been there. I'd actually spent some time there when I, in my childhood, and it hadn't changed a bit. Honestly, I, I thought I was in a time machine, and the road was the same, all the same potholes, everything. And the thing that occurred to me when I, when I visited there is I thought, nobody's coming here. Nobody. And so, uh, you know, the roads aren't fixed. There's, you know, everybody, uh, none, of the, none of the parks looked like they had been touched in years. But the point is that we're the exact opposite here. So all, a lot of people are moving into Snohomish County, which creates problems like housing costs and traffic and all that. But it also, you know, creates a vibrant community as well. But it definitely creates challenges, and housing is one of them right now. Um, it, you know, people looking for a house or looking for a place to live is expensive. So I would say, you know, Marysville's taking on its more than its fair share. I mean, there, there's a lot of building going on in Marysville, and I think a lot of times the council and I are a little concerned about the infrastructure keeping up with that. But how that works, just so you know, is the state has what's called a, a Growth Management Act that was passed in the early 1990s. And it, it dictates to cities what growth you will take. So your city leadership doesn't have a whole lot of say in that. You, there's a certain allotment that you take, and that's updated every eight years or so, I think. We're going to have a comp plan update here in, is it 24, Haley? Yeah, 2024. And that'll dictate the growth we have to take for that next uh, realm of time. And we have to provide the zoning for that growth. And then it's private property, right? They can, they can build on that. And so... It's not as simple as just saying, well, we, we want a lot more or we don't want a lot more. The state kind of dictates in urban areas and cities what you're going to take. And you zone for that. And then if the private, indus if private industry builds it, then they build it. And if they don't, they don't. Um, but I think it's important to understand that because uh, we, all, we a lot of times feel a little hamstrung in that area uh, on both sides of it, you know, as far as uh, uh, what we can and can't do. Yeah. Yeah. Is it being allowed under the zoning for a mother who wants to read on some of these? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Accessory dwelling units? Yeah. So now it's okay to it, I'm going to ask Haley, to, she's our planner, what we, the council passed some things around, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you could just specify kind of what's allowed here uh, as far as accessory dwelling units. accessory dwelling units and then reduce parking requirements so if anyone has questions about it please uh, grab me after the meeting and I can give you more information and, and go through specifics with your property good question thank you yeah you another question online online okay um, asking if the golf course is profitable <laughs> yeah great question well thank you it is finally <laughs> yeah the golf course is profitable. That's a good question. We, um, you know, we struggled with golf for a number of years where um, where it wasn't profitable, and then we made a move. Um, our parks, culture, and recreation team brought on uh, Premier Golf, and it's amazing the ingenuity they were able to bring. And you know, cities aren't always experts at running golf courses and things like that. So we brought on some experts. They brought costs down, brought some new features in that were important to the golf community. Have kept it cutting edge. 
and the debt's paid off and it's making money now. So we're able to pay the general fund back and invest back in the golf course at the same time. In fact, the bu last budget that the council passed had some nice new equipment investments and stuff. So pleased to say that the golf course is making money and we love having a municipal golf course in Marysville. It's a really nice asset to be able to provide the community and uh, as well as our restaurant, Bleacher's Restaurant up there that Jeff Dara runs is just a great part of our community. And I know a lot of people enjoy that. Did you have another one online? What about in here? Yeah. <clears throat> um, there were some drawings or pictures done up on Asbury Park there off of 4th Street at one time. Is there still something planned for like a dog walking park? Yeah. Something like that? Um, nothing imminent on, yeah, he's talking about Asbury Park. We had, a, had some drawings up at one time on a, on a dog walking park. Nothing imminent there. That would, um, that's owned by the uh, school district and so, you know, it doesn't mean we couldn't in the future, but um, but if we had another dog walking park, it would probably be in a in a, um, in a different area than that. So the, yeah, there's nothing imminent there. Yeah, it was a yeah something that we were looking at a, a while back, but yeah. <clears throat> Do we have a uh, an ordinance, a building ordinance uh, that, that for height on stuff? Because this seems to be the, it, the tallest buildings in the area. Yes. Yeah, we do want to, in this, um, that's a good question. So do we have an uh, ordinance for height? We expanded that because we would like to see um, the ability to go up in the community. You know, as, as we get more and more crowded, you know, the ability to go up will be important. And so, yeah, we're, um, what, well, how many stories do we allow now, A, of the end of the new one? Uh, up to 75 feet in the downtown area. Okay, 75 feet. Good. Yeah, that was pretty quick. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we have made that change, and, and this building is a good example of that, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> what other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Is there, um, there's no pool in Marysville, a public pool, is that correct? N correct. No, there's no, well, there's no public pool in Marysville. Um, that the city government has, but the school district has Marysville Pilchuck High School's pool, and the YM. This is not a public pool. But the YMCA has a pool as well for members. But the you do you you do have the MPHS uh, pool that is available. Yes. There's a question online about is there going to be a senior center? Yeah, good question. Is there going to be a senior center? So we what we did with the community center is. Um, a good portion of our programming there is for seniors, but we also want to make sure that people of all ages can enjoy it because it's, it's three times larger than, than what we've had before. So we call it a community center so that, you know, as you saw, you've got young people in there. We think that integration is really healthy to have all ages in a community center, a vibrant place where the community can kind of call home. So. I would say that is our senior center. It's not called a senior center, but if you go through there, you'll see um, seniors' classes predominate, and they always will be a priority. We'll always, let's put it this way, if there's seniors that want to gather in numbers and do something, we will find space for them in that facility because that's what it's designed for. But we believe that it's really healthy for, to bring people together of all ages and have them integrated in a community center atmosphere. So that's, hopefully, hopefully that answers the question. I hope... Hope whoever that was has had a chance to, to go to the community center and maybe enjoy a, a class. Thank you for asking that. Everybody has to ask a question before we leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, uh, I do want to make sure I answer all the questions because uh, I don't have anywhere to be, but you, you all might. <laughs> Is there any final questions online or in the audience here? Happy to answer them. It's one of my favorite parts. Yes. Can we um, reinstate the golf camp for kids at the golf course? Ooh, that's a good question. Can we look into that, Tara? That was a popular. It, it kind of took a siesta during COVID, so it could be something that could. Okay. Golf camp for kids. Uh, for those that online, it, yeah, we'll look at trying to bring that back here. Uh, it has been out for a few years. Good, good question. I do remember that being a, a popular item a few years back. So. That's another on our to-do list to look at. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. I'm going to say, Mayor, thank you for all you do for our city. Would you 
like to introduce your family because they are your backbone? Oh, thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. My wife, Marianne, down here. My mom, Diane. And my son, Nick. And my other son, Nate. And Kristen was here, uh, my daughter. And so thank you. And they uh, are an amazing support. And I couldn't do what I do without them. And they're amazing. So thanks. Thanks so much for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs>